Hi, Kerry. So I'm going to hand over now to Kerry Ward, who's going to be the moderator for the session, who's convened uh, the speakers together. And Kerry is the Customer Research Programme Lead at AWS. So thank you so much, Kerry, for organising this. And I'm going to mute myself now, and the floor is all yours. Okay, great. Thanks, Ray. Thank you to Sue as well for having us all here today. Um, as Ray said, I'm Carrie, and um, I am a part of a global sales insights team at AWS. Um, I spent many years on the provider side before I came to the client side. Um, and about a year ago, I decided to, to take this plunge. And it is definitely a different world. And I'm learning on the job. And so when Ray approached me about um, presentations for this um, day today, I decided that what I wanted to do was reach out to my network and talk to some experts about what it takes to build a really powerful insights practice, one that has a lot of impact on the company and, and plays a big role in company strategy. So um, I reached out, as I said, to my network. And with me here today, I have Carol Gleason, who's the Director of Global Commercial Insights at the Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson & Johnson. Pashmina Halal, who's Head of Industry Research and Thought Leadership at Google. Kendra Speed, who has just left her role as Head of her Customer Strategy and Insights at Dropbox, and Kendra's on the move, and we'll have to wait patiently for her big reveal. Um, and I just, again, I wanted to get us all together to talk about um, what it takes to build a really strong insights team. So let's dive into questions, I guess. So for the panel, what one element of your career, whether it's job experience or training or skills, what has helped you succeed today in your role as an insights leader? Kendra, do you want to kick it off? Sure. Thank you so much for having us on this panel today. Um, thank you, Carrie, for your leadership and pulling this together. So as I reflect on my career and think about, you know, what have been some of the pivotal components um, to getting me to the place where I am today and continuing to grow, um, the first I would call out is like a very strong foundation. So, uh, you know, I always talk about myself as this classically trained market researcher, having started my career at P&G and really getting a strong foundation to build upon. And then from there, I will say, I spent five years there. And then from that point on, um, you know, really been evolving in my career. So I think looking back, um, it really has been being willing to take on risk and taking on positions in industries that are quite varied. Um, that's one of the things that I'm known for today is kind of being able to get into a new industry, adapt quickly. So I've been in CPG, tires, real estate, technology, and next week I'll be in food. So, you know, it's that's really been one of the big things for me is kind of like this adaptability and continuing to grow and reinvent myself. Okay, Pashmina, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, well, also thank you um, for getting this group together. I think um, it's always really great to see, again, leadership, insights level. Um, so thank you. Um, you know, it's interesting because I like really relate to both, um, Kendra, what you just said, and Carrie, kind of how you've transitioned from being on the provider side and moving in-house. And these are the type of um, experiences that allow for the buildability, as well as like, again, to Kendra's point, adaptability of moving um, and continuously growing in the space. Um, a little bit of a different um, or maybe provocative uh, kind of response too is, you know, I recently hired an executive coach. Um, and I think that there's one thing around core competencies in your role. Um, and, and as of recently, I think is especially as you get higher within an organization, getting that outside in view um, and that perspective is really critical. I think sometimes, especially within like a research and insights role, um, you're really in the weeds. Um, you don't have a lot of time to always think about um, 
the external forces that play a role within the work that you do. And um, it also allows you to flip a switch and think a little differently. Again, like I think we get so um, focused on the core role and what it is that we do within the organizations that we work for. And I found that there's there's moments where um, I say it's like flipping a switch where you think a little bit differently and it actually allows you to think more expansively um, in the in your role at the organization and kind of opportunities um, to kind of forge um, new pathways or even think about your career in a different way. That's super interesting and good for you for taking that taking that initiative, it actually, um, it reminds me a little bit about something that Carol and I were talking about a few weeks ago um, in that, you know, market insights teams don't necessarily always have the best reputation within organizations. Um, and so I think one of the things that we need to do is, you know, have a really good understanding of the organization around us and, and build that reputation, build that trust. Um, and Carol, I don't know if you remember, but you had talked a little bit about how you do that within your organization. Absolutely. I think, you know, this is related to your first question as well. Um, I think it's very important for us as insights professionals to understand our stakeholders and know who they are and what they're looking for. Um, to me, this is critical and you know, one way I, I personally have done that. So unlike Kendra, who has been moving, who's moved from different industries, I've stayed within the pharma and biotech industry, but I've taken on different roles. So I've taken on marketing roles, I've taken on clinical roles, et cetera, around within the, within the organization. So I feel like I've over, over the past several years, I've kind of understood the perspectives of my stakeholders now as being an insights lead. So I, um, yeah, I definitely believe that um, like understanding your stakeholders is absolutely critical in our jobs. Yeah, and actually I think we spend a fair amount of time um, not just working on, you know, establishing a really good reputation internally, but also building trust with those stakeholders, um, which is a little bit, you know, what you were talking about, Carol, in terms of understanding their needs. Um, but does anyone want to add anything related to um, building trust with stakeholders and how we do that? I, I mean, it's some. Oh, go ahead, Kendra. No, you go ahead. So I would say, and, and it's recently been something that we've been spending more time doing is asking why. So in our role, you know, we're working with a sales team that has, you know, Fortune 500, 1,000, you know, services clients. And, you know, you, you, you get a request in and um, I think not spending enough time truly understanding like the why behind what it is that they're asking for and spending, you know, that 10 or 15 minutes of trying to really get down to the bottom of like the challenge or the issue or the request I think is really important, but it also just shows that you listen, um, which I, 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 and again, like carried your point, like maybe, you know, maybe there's sometimes we get like a bad rap within the companies that we work for. Maybe we don't understand this, or maybe we're hard to understand as like a group or um, in a piece of an org. But I do think like spending time with the why um, I've realized really does open a little bit more of the vulnerability or kind of the need of what it is that they're, what their ask is. Yeah. We've actually just recently put a lot of structure around how we handle that first call with our stakeholders. So, um, and asking the why, or how did you come to that conclusion? What's your hypothesis and how did you get there? What other information did you have? So that kind of structure around that conversation really enables us to dive deep initially to get a better understanding of what their you know, business challenges are. Um, so we have a question from the audience that I wanted to pose. Kimberly Nicholson, thank you for your question. Um, the question is, what are some of the biggest challenges and tips for someone looking to move into an insights role from an agency role, particularly if you have a lot of agency experience? Um, so I, you can I've go only ahead. spent a very short period of time. I freelanced for two years too. Um, and so some of the things I think about is 
being able to demonstrate the ability to come in and think holistically about the business and think beyond a given engagement or project or learning need to what is the totality or the comprehensive knowledge that a team needs. I would see that as one of the big opportunities. Um, and on the flip, what I would say is for those who are coming from the agency side who have a really keen understanding of customer service, of delivering in a way that um, it can be impactful and understanding audience needs, I think that's something that really looks like a strength or a plus that we're that we really need within our um, field of expertise on the client side. So I will say there's some challenges, but I think there are also some really great strengths that agency partners bring to the table. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I would say, I guess I would come back to um, being a little bit flexible. So. Um, when I made my switch, I decided first which company I wanted to work for. Um, and then I, you know, started applying to different roles within this organization. Um, and that allowed me to, you know, not only bring the expertise that I learned on the provider side, um, but also really demonstrate you know, my passion for the, the culture at AWS and why I wanted to be part of it and what I could add to it with my research expertise. Um, you know, I, I actually only applied for roles at Amazon, so uh, I'm not sure I have a broad list of tips and tricks for making the transition, except that I would say, you know, I picked the place where I wanted to be and I, and I stuck it out until I got a role here. Yeah, I'd agree. I I, I worked um, uh, at an ad, at an ad agency actually for about seven years prior to moving over on the research side, and um, that uh, was essentially just it was spurred based on the work that I was doing in the areas right. I was leaning into. So at on you know first glance, working at an ad, ad agency, being an account manager at the time, like probably didn't feel like something that would parlay me into a role where I'm doing head of research and thought leadership at Google, but you start spending more time doing the analysis and spending more time with the research that's being conducted with the clients that you have um, when you're working at an agency and you start leaning into those areas more and more and build your skill set. Like I think that a lot of times like on the job skill building is actually um, very real and I think it's actually um, very applicable when thinking about moving on um, to a role um, into research and insights, even if it isn't something that you necessarily um, thought you were going to do, um, or it's necessarily your background. Yeah, yep, that's a great point. Um, I should have also shared that um, I was a an SVP at Ipsos in my previous role, and I led a very large team with a, a large remit, um, and I had a lot of responsibility. And in order to make this transition, mm -hmm. I chose a role where I am now an individual contributor. Um, so that to me is a way for me was a way of getting into the organization and learning the ropes. Um, it's not what I want. Ultimately, I look forward to leading my own insights practice um, at AWS down the road. But um, it was definitely a way to get my foot in the door. And it was also in retrospect, just by luck, I I guess, um, a really good choice because it is a very big transition. It's a really different different world. Um, so I wanted to ask each of you, um, as you're building out your teams, what do you think about what expertise or experience or roles do you look to fill um, to build a really well-rounded, successful insights team? And maybe we'll start with Carol this time. Sure. Um, so I'm currently doing that right now. So this question is very timely because it's a top of mind for me. Um, so the first thing I thought about is, um, you know, what, what is the role of insights within the organization, within the key stakeholders? And so for me, it's around forecasting. It's around understanding the voice of the customer from physicians, patients and payers, and also um, 
competitive intelligence, understanding what are, you know, all the intricacies of what um, competing companies are doing and understanding the space from a high level strategic perspective. So I knew I identified those three key areas for the insights team. And this is where really it's the backbone of the sorts of skill sets that I'm looking for. Because my team is small, I am looking for versatility. Um, I, I think that's the top thing I am currently looking for is someone who can switch into any one of these roles, one who can do a um, conduct very good primary market research, someone who can do quantitative work, um, analyze um, um, sales data and claims data, but also understand uh, the intricacies of what our, you know, um, the development paths of what our competitors are doing. So it's, it, I'm looking for someone who's got a lot of flexibility. That's great, thank you. Uh, Pashmina or Kendra, anything to add to that? I do have a couple thoughts on this. Um, you know, definitely agree as I think about kind of breadth and depth across different, you know, classical research methodologies. I wanted to focus in on what some might say are some of the softer, you know, components of the role. So some of the things I'm looking for just generally are like curiosity, like um, really having a genuine passion for learning, you know, asking the whys and being naturally curious. Um, also this innovation. So I think it's important that we, yes, be rooted in um, classical methodologies as well as learning about new ones. But I, I also look for like this hunger or this ingenuity about saying when we're faced with tough challenges of time, of scope, of budget, how do we adapt those traditional methodologies to really meet the needs of our internal and sometimes external customers, a degree of grit, stick to itness. Um, because oftentimes, you know, in insights function, we're in a place in a uh, company specifically, you know, as you think about being in tech of where market insights might be in a heavy influence role of kind of going uphill um, to influence, yes, to do our recommendation, but also just to have a seat at the table. So we need to have this degree of grit and won't give up at the, the first sign of challenge. And then, you know, this hunger to continuously learn. So not being stuck in the way that we've always done it, but being open to thinking about how could we do it differently? Um, so kind of that mentality. Yeah, That's I love great. that. I mean, I completely Wonderful. agree with Carol and Kendra. Like we, we, yeah, uh, not to give too much of an under the hood at Google, but like, we you know, we call them the three C's. It's curiosity, collaboration, and competencies. And again, like the competency piece um, isn't necessarily about, you know, what's your background and, you know, do you know how to use SPSS or do you know how to know how to run a regression analysis? But um, how do you, and I think Kendra and Carol both mentioned this, like take what you know and be able to, um, it, it, and, and, and use it for a role that, uh, maybe you don't have necessarily the exact cookie cutter, like what it is that you should should know, but you can um, kind of transfer it um, appropriately. So spot on. I completely agree with um, what Carolyn Kendra said. Great. Um, we have actually a question that maybe we can take from the attendees here from Shelly McArdle, who asks, insights teams have a clear role in industries like CPG, hospitality, and value has been demonstrated over time. How is the role of insights different for tech organizations that are more quantitative, hard, big data based? Do you have tips for how to best position an insights team within these types of companies? Well, on the pharma side, I think I initially thought that where you know it's more quantitative, hard, big data, but I've learned that um, the, it, it, it is, but also it isn't because when uh, one of the big remits that we have is to understand the patients and patients are not hard, big data sources. You know, it's really understanding um, the, the burden of the disease and the treatments on them and understanding how 
caregivers are also affected and families. So I think uh, at least on the pharma and biotech side, um, we're, we're constantly gathering insights from social media and, and um, interviewing patients and their families to understand their, um, the burdens that they're facing. The hard side is when we're trying to quantify it because on the pharma side, we need to quantify those in some way so that we can get it into our prescribing label and be able to promote because it's so highly regulated. But um, I do think that it's like in pharma, it's, it's quite equal to try to understand all the, all the, different, um, all, all the different perceptions that the stakeholders within the healthcare industry have. Yeah, I paused for a second. Yeah, um, I think I would say, go ahead, Kendra. No, go ahead, Carrie. Oh, I was just going to say that, um, you know, I think for me so far, what I've seen is that, um, you know, it's a bit of a balancing act. Obviously, we have, you know, tons of data and some of it is at our disposal and some of it is not. Um and all of that can be really challenging. But even when we, you know, do conduct primary research and end up with our own data, um, having an interview, or even if it's just one, or having an open-ended question that, you know, brings that data to life, um, puts a customer face to that insight, can really be huge for stakeholders. Um, especially if they're learning something for the first time or they're surprised by what they're hearing, um, you know, bringing uh, that, that hard data to life and a little bit more, you know, putting a humanistic spin on it is, can be really uh, important. Kendra, did you want to say something? Sure. Uh, one thing I was going to say is I also see... Um, traditionally in tech companies, so for instance, at Dropbox, um, in addition to a, you know, market insights um, function, there also is a design research group, um, and much larger than um, the folks who are working on insights. So one, I think it's important to demonstrate what value market insights brings to the table, which can be both qualitative and quantitative. Um, in my experience, I found that, um, yes, market insights was looked to as being a bit more quantitative than qualitative. I think that that is a bit of a myth. So I think one is debunking that myth. The other piece is partnering across the organization so that we're working with people who are, you know, like kind of the big data folks along with um, you know, the re user researchers who have in-depth user understanding so that we're bringing together holistic stories um, that really help bring the, the customer to life. I don't see it as an, you know, either or. It's about how do we bring um, insights, data together so that it's very clear and impactful for the business to how they move based upon what we put together. So I don't think it's a qual versus quant. Um, discussion. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kendra, I, I know that uh, you had agreed previously. Is, is there a way you could tell us about a project or an initiative that you spearheaded that was really impactful within your organization? And tell us a little bit about what, you know, what made it so impactful? Okay. Um, without going in depth about the specific product. Um, yes. So we had put together jointly um, with the product design, marketing, design research, insights teams, a learning plan for um, really being able to qualify um, the customer related elements of a new product. We had placed one part of our learning plan, call it six months out and which was very important. So it was really about understanding the personas, our target audience. And it really sat as a deliverable on the design research side. And our partners were saying, hey, we really need to pull this up. We need it like today. We need it in four weeks. 
And so what this looked like was the team coming together, understanding the risk profile of what we need to do. Um, Insight saying, hey, we can take on a part of this and accelerate some of this. So let's partner with design research to understand how it was scoped. And then being able to say a good, better, best approach of saying, if we did this just good and scrappy, here's what I would say. We could get something back in two to four weeks. Better, um, we can do both qual and quant. It's going to be really tough, but maybe we can do it in four to six weeks. And then saying like, here's what I really recommend is kind of best in class, what we need to do. So first was coming up with the good, better, best for the holistic team to look at. We aligned to the better. And the important part of that was saying, we were an integrated project team. We brought in our vendor who was right there with us and we went really fast. So it went from saying one week we were doing the meta analysis. We have a meeting, we come to a decision point. Next week we're doing qual, um, we're going over the weekend. We come back together, we make decisions on where we wanna go. We go into the quant to quantify um, how we're really thinking about our archetypes. Week four, we come back with the synthesized learning as well as with um, you know, the personas. And at the end of week four, we're sharing it out with our product and design partners and um, providing our recommendations for moving forward. As I think about the success of this, it really hinged on one, the integrated project team and having everyone at the table to get the work done. So this wasn't just tossing it over the fence and saying, hey, see you in four weeks. So we were able to keep up to speed with the project team as they kept working. And so when the work was delivered, it was relevant and it could be used right away. The other thing was being flexible, uh, uh, being able to have frank conversations about the risk involved in taking any course of action and then being able to work together to mitigate that risk. And then having you know that touch point at the end so we could go directly into action. And what the end result of that looks like is that the team was able to, yes, have these archetypes personas to, to design off of and also to market based upon, but then also um, some of the other insights from the work really helped drive the product, um, you know, goal beachhead for the product as they went into um, this year. So that's an example of kind of the successful agile research mentality and a sprint of getting in there and being able to deliver as a team. That's really fantastic. Congrats. Um, there are a couple of things that um, I related to as you were talking. So one of the things that we do on the team I'm on is we try to collaborate on whatever level uh, we can. You know, perhaps a sales team will come to us or a go-to-marketing team will come to us and ask us a question. It may or may not be primary research related or it may not be something that we necessarily do, but we try to collaborate as much as possible one, to start building relationships, um, but also to learn as much as we can from the business. Um, the other thing that I related to was um, what is at Amazon a leadership principle that's called bias for action. Um, but, you know, that states that, you know, if we have data, we can make a decision. And oftentimes we may, you know, make a decision, go down a path and realize that wasn't necessarily the right path, but very few decisions are one way doors where you can't, you know, actually revert and try something else. Um, and we also uh, tend to test and learn. Sometimes we call it test and fail. Um, but essentially that's an accepted way of working here because, you know, again, once you have some data to prove that that's not the right approach, you can refine your approach and move down a different path. So, um, thanks for sharing that. That was really great. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions from the, um, attendees. One is from Annie. Hi, Annie. Um, and it is, what are some non-traditional techniques you use to bring in expertise from underrepresented groups or from immigrants? Anyone want to take that one? So um, what, what, I am, what I have done in the past is, um, well, a lot of 
biotech and pharma companies have patient advocacy groups. So these are, it's usually one person in a small company or a larger team at a larger company where they do outreach to advocacy groups. Yes, they represent the company, but the idea is to let to provide support um, to these advocacy groups. There's you know, no strings attached. You know, it's all very compliant from that perspective. But I've usually, um, when I need to speak to very specific groups, I have reached out to the advocacy team to, to leverage, maybe if I needed to do a survey, um, they've been kind enough to allow me to use their advocacy groups where I would create the survey and then send it off to the advocacy group for approval. And then they are the ones who send it out within their teams. So I think um, internally um, that that's one way that I've, I've done something that was very targeted to, you know, to reach an underrepresented group. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let's see, from Megan Bauer, we have another question. What are some of the greatest challenges that Insights teams currently face and how is your organization working to address them? Ashmina, you want to take a turn? Sure. Um, I think we're at this, um, it's a pivotal moment, right? Like it's a good one where Insights teams are, um, and we're talking about this on this, on this call today, are like, you know, feeling empowered and we, we do feel like we have a role within the business. But on, on the flip side, as our customers, our clients, our key stakeholders have more access to data, um, I think that at least within my role, um, it's becoming harder and harder to tell a really great, novel, actionable, credible story. Um, and so, you know, and again, like when we're supporting um, clients, uh, it's their data is actually the richest data. We obviously don't have access to it. The, the, the opportunity that our clients have today to leverage their data to just better understand who their customer is. And, and you know, Kendra was kind of speaking about this and Carol, you know, obviously can do this as well. Um, when you become um, a support function for those companies, being, I think the biggest challenge I've seen is that, you know, I can run studies and, you know, back in the day I was working with Carrie at Ipsos and asking her to help me better understand X, Y, Z, like it becomes harder and harder to be really, really juicy with what you bring back to the table. Um, so I would say that's probably one of the biggest challenges yeah. that we face and making sure it's actionable at the same time. Yeah. I definitely feel like the roles, the insight roles can easily so quickly turn into a transactional role. I cannot tell you how many times someone comes up to me and says, we need to do a quantitative study in 100 people. You know, it's, it's more like I, I'd like to understand more about what the objective is and what you want as opposed to you, like it, it, it is pretty interesting how people can immediately just already set the methodology um, at the forefront, you know? Um, so to me, I think it's very, very easy for our roles to turn into something that's purely transactional. To me, that's a, a big challenge that we have. To yeah. Appreciate. Yeah. And actually, that was, you know, kind of the final question that we had planned um, among the among our group of panelists here. And that was, you know, what has helped you get a seat at the table at your organization to and, you know, for me, when I think about that, I think about Carol, as you were saying, playing less of a transactional role and more of a strategic role where we can be driving planning and involved in planning and driving planning as opposed to reacting uh, post haste. Any thoughts on how we can get a seat at the table? I do have a thought um, as it relates to getting a seat at the table and I mean, it, it is around bringing value and understanding the business. The other thing, and I'm trying to find the right way to say it. The other thing is that many of us have, you know, a depth and years of experience that we're bringing into our organizations that um, our teams could value. So I think about being at Dropbox in a, you know, highly tech product oriented um, culture, just quite transparently, there was an opportunity to share 
a level of expertise and understanding of how to approach business problems that I think also brings you to the table, like kind of saying, hey, let's talk about market opportunity and the different ways that we can think about it um, and leveraging expertise and then setting it in context. So using that as kind of the hook to say, let's talk about what your business problems are, really coming to the table as a consultant that leans on, yes, all of this expertise, but then applying it to the business problem. I think that's the important thing. I think it's not just being this, you know, toolkit of like, oh, can you pull out a, a pricing study, you know, and go out and do the pricing study. But really it's what Carol was saying, what everyone's saying is understanding what the problem is and leveraging experience to bring everyone up to speed in thinking about, you know, how to approach these business challenges. For sure. And I don't know what um, other folks have done, and I'm kind of curious to hear, but what I've also tried to do is um, what Carrie was saying about being more proactive. So I will set up the meeting and set an agenda. So in a way, I do try to kind of put myself in that position by, you know, calling the meeting with our leadership, et cetera, and kind of, you know, laying out and asking those questions. What do we want to do? So, um, you know, that's, a, I think that's another thing that I think we as insights professionals should, should do as best practice. That's wonderful. I love that suggestion. Um, so Ray, I, I think we're about at time. Um, unless you have a few more minutes to spare, there are a couple more open questions in the Q&A. Um, but if you want to keep it tight, I will hand it back to you. No, if you, if you want to take those questions, that's great. People are loving this. Okay, great. Uh, so from Brian Wood, we have, what are your thoughts on moving from an insights team researcher role to a manager of CX and voice of the customer role within a new and growing CX function in your organ in our organization? What's CX? Customer experience. Customer experience. Oh, oh customer experience. Okay. So from an insights team researcher role to a manager of customer experience and voice of the customer role within a new and growing customer experience function within our organization? I always say yes, go for it. If yeah, you think I, you to, like expand your skill set and like if it's growing and puts you in that forefront role, I, I mean, I, I'm always a big proponent of taking on those opportunities. I completely agree. I mean, I almost see it as like insights researcher role and CX is like a piece of that where you really get to develop a skill set. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, I think understanding your customer, and I think we've heard it a couple of times, whether it's the patient, the customer, the advocate, um, like those are critical um, skills and just understanding. Um, we always say customer's customer um, is incredibly important to understand um, in order to really be able to marry like what it is that we are trying to ask our, our customers to do. Yep, for sure. Um, so another one from Randall Beard, what impact is system one versus system two and behavioral science thinking having on your function? Also, how is your function deploying machine learning and for what applications? So we, um, we've been using uh, machine, so I, I'm in the area of rare disease. So finding patients uh, with our diseases is, is very difficult to find to to find them and to also understand what their clinical profiles look like. So what we've done is use claims data to you know we've used um, AI to analyze the claims data. So instead of going in like the traditional, you know the traditional study is I have a hypothesis about these patients. So when we go into the data, let's look for this, 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 and that. What we did with machine learning is. We think these patients have these four key, um, key um, diagnostic codes. So you go in, look for them, and, you, and look at what the patterns are coming out. And you tell us what sort of comorbid conditions does this group have? 
Um, what's, um, you know, how many are female versus male? What, you know, what um, outcomes are they experiencing? So we, it's more, I always forget, it's like an inductive approach um, to, um, to, uh, to identifying the clinical profile of the patients that we're looking into. So, I mean, at least for me recently, that's been the most recent application of what we've been using for, um, a, uh, using AI for. That's great. Uh, Pashmina, this one is from for you from Brooke Miller. Pashmina mentioned it's becoming harder to tell novel, actionable stories. How do you think insights is changing? Do you think methodologies or the way you work will be different in three years? I, so I don't think anything like with meth. Well, I shouldn't say methodologies aren't changing. Like machine learning and AI was something that we probably didn't talk about as much um, as like a method in order to better understand what we need um, or kind of like actionability, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago. But I just think the bar's higher, right? Like I, I think that's more the question or, or maybe the answer to your question is um, what makes a really great insight or the way that we think about it is again, like it's new, it's something no one else has said. It's actionable so you can do something with it. It's relatable or relative so that you can understand um, the size or the opportunity. And then it's credible. So it's from a really great credible source. I think the simplicity of an insight and thinking about it in that way is very, um, can stand the test of time. Um, but I just think that as again, like we have access to more data and, and, and it's easier to access at our fingertips, um, the bar is raised higher um, because we, you know, are continually um, in that why curious mode of like, why does it happen? Why does that happen? Why did that happen? Like, it's almost like you can keep on digging. Um, but again, like innovation will only allow us to get better at um, providing great insights. So I would maybe think about it that way. Um, maybe not just the component of what an insight is. That's great. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, Carol, Pajmina, Kendra, thank you so much uh, for joining the panel today. And uh, quite honestly, I look forward to our next discussion like this. Uh, so Ray, I'll hand it over to you again.